Hello, welcome back. We made it through our first chapter in American Nation, and now we're really getting into some of the real meat of what we're going to be talking about this year. And we're going to start things off right here in Chapter 5, Section 1, with the French and Indian War. Uh, this is a really important time in our history, so I'm really excited for us to have a chance to talk about it. Now, today's lesson is going to be a little bit on, a little bit longer than usual, uh, but I don't want you to get discouraged. I want you to take your time, go through everything, because there's a lot of a lot of things in this lesson that eventually we will build on in the future. And the first things first, our essential question for today is, what part did the American colonies play in bringing about an end to the ongoing conflict between England and France? Now, looking at that essential question and looking at some of the key words in that, it uh, mentions an ongoing conflict. So this is uh, the fighting between England and France had been going on for years and years and years, and so eventually it got to the colonies. So there was a part that the U.S. played in, or not the U.S., but the colonies played in it. So, But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's take a look at our key terms. Obviously, French and Indian War. We will also talk about the Albany Plan of Union, the Plains of Abraham, and the Treaty of Paris. Now, this Treaty of Paris, there's been there's been a lot of Treaty of Parises, 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 Paris, whatever the treaties of Paris. How about we'll go with that? But this one in particular brought an end to the French and Indian War. So, just take that and uh, put that back there in the sticky part of your brain, and we'll save it for later. So, like I said, today we're going to be starting our talk about the conflicts that would eventually lead to the War for Independence. And this uh, French and Indian War, it's one of the conflicts that leads ultimately to independence for uh, for the colonies in North America. But um, our first video is going to it uses reenactments along with dialogue and other and pictures and things to show what uh, what was going on in the early life of a very familiar character to anyone who has studied anything about American history. So we're going to watch this and uh, we'll pick right up with our the rest of our discussion for today. La Guerre was a visionary. He saw that the struggle for North America had global implications. If the French lost, France would be weakened in Europe as well. For Britain, the stakes were just as high. If it allowed France to dominate the Ohio country, the British colonies could never expand westward. So British authorities send an expedition to order the French to withdraw from the Ohio country. The man they picked to lead it? None other than the 21-year-old Virginian, George Washington. Washington is a natural choice. Brimming with ambition, imposingly tall, he is well-connected and eager to make a name for himself. Washington draws his own map of the journey that will take him past the forks of the Ohio to Fort LaBeouf near Lake Erie, a 500-mile journey that gets underway just as winter sets in. Along the route, Washington comes to a French base. The officer in charge gives a warm welcome to the young Virginian. But the French make it very clear they won't give in to his ultimatum. That night, he invited us to sup with them. Soon, the wine, which they dosed themselves with freely, loosened their tongues. With utmost charm, the officer lets him know the sentiment among the French in the region. They told us that it was their absolute design to take possession of the Ohio, and by God, they would do it. For, though the English could raise two men to their one, they knew our actions were too slow to prevent any undertaking of theirs. 
Brushed off by the French, Washington starts back to Virginia in December 1753. His report on the mission goes all the way to London, where King George II hears of the young Virginian who had done his best, but failed to persuade the French to leave the Ohio Valley. The following spring, the Virginians take up the Half King's offer to build a trading post at the forks of the Ohio. But it's not to be. Almost immediately, French troops forced the Virginians to surrender the forks and abandon their unfinished building. The Half King is furious. By taking the forks, the French have humiliated him, and the inability of the English to fight back makes him look like he's backed the losing side. He calculates how to get even. It's the young George Washington who unwittingly offers him that chance. That's how Washington came to ambush the French, his first taste of battle. That same spring of 1754, Washington is on his way back to the forks with orders to help the Virginians finish their trading post. When he learns he is too late, he makes plans to confront the French and take the forks back. The Half King agrees to be his ally. But Washington doesn't realize that the Indian leader has a complicated agenda of his own. If the Half King orchestrates a confrontation between the British and the French, it will strengthen his own hand in the region. Why does the Half King go further and kill the wounded Frenchman? It's an act of revenge for his humiliation at the forks, and a message to the French to back off. And he knows the blame will fall on George Washington, not himself. <laughs> You are not dead yet, my father, says the half-king. An ironic twist to the respectful term the Indians usually use for their French allies. Washington's skirmish alone probably would not have triggered a larger war. But the cold-blooded murder of their wounded officer, the French couldn't possibly let that go without a response. Within weeks, the brother of the slain Ensign Jumonville sets off in pursuit. Meanwhile, Washington has withdrawn his men to a large meadow. They build a crude stockade that the Virginians wryly name Fort Necessity. Washington expects the Half King to help defend the fort. But the Indian leader has lost confidence in the young major. This Washington, he is a good natured man, but he has no experience. Always driving us to fight by his direction. And now he wants us to make a stand with him against the French. And that little thing upon the meadow. Washington's only Indian ally leaves. We have no choice. We will make our stand here. The French have no such problems with their native allies. They arrive accompanied by 100 Shawnee, Mingo, and Delaware warriors. 
About nine o'clock on the 3rd of July, the enemy advanced with shouts and dismal Indian yells. I'm alive! Washington intends to fight face to face in the field, European style. But the French and their Indian allies don't cooperate. They then, from every little rising tree, bush, stump, and stone, kept up a golden, constant fire, which we returned as best we could. What? Till late in the afternoon, when there fell the most tremendous rain that can be conceived. trenches with water and wet not only the ammunition and the fire locks but also the few stores that we had leaving us only a few bayonets for defense by nightfall the situation is hopeless The French commander offers terms for surrender. Washington signs the soggy document. Unable to read French, he relies on a Dutch officer to translate. It turns out that Jumonville's brother is taking a sweet revenge. Washington doesn't learn until later that the document includes a confession to the assassination of Ensign Jumonville. The morning after the battle, the victorious French allowed Washington to retreat towards Virginia with his wounded and tattered troops. Word of his defeat spread quickly. This was not the kind of fame the young Washington had been seeking. The date, oddly enough, was the 4th of July, 1754. The defeat at Fort Necessity proves disastrous for the half-king as well. Any clout he has among the region's Indians has now evaporated. Within months, the half-king is dead. A Delaware chief described the uncertain situation in the Ohio country that fall of 1754. Things seem to take another turn, he said, and a high wind is rising. As war clouds gather, the powerful Iroquois League ponders its strategy. If they take sides in this white man's war, there's a good chance they will find themselves fighting against other Indians. But if they remain neutral, there's also the chance either France or Britain will take possession of the Ohio country. And if that happens, the Iroquois could end up with nothing at all. European rivals in North America. Now, as you can see from this map, uh, by the middle of the 1700s, North and South America had been divided up mainly between, between a bunch of European countries, but uh, primarily between Great Britain, France, Spain, and Russia. And, but Spain had primarily taken over uh, what is now Central and South America, and Russian America was, is now like the coast of Alaska. But uh, each of these nations laid claim to different parts of the New World, but they didn't want to start, stop there. Uh, England and France, Spain, Portugal, Russia, they they wanted more and more influence in North America, but the biggest conflict was between these two longtime rivals, England and France, and that's where our discussion is going to take us today.
Now, in the beginning, the settlers really kind of stayed away from each other. English settlers stayed along the coast, and French settlers, uh, they had arrived much later than the English settlers. They moved up into what is now Canada and all through the Ohio Valley. Um, so I want to take a look at this map and take note of how... Actually, you know what? I'm going to go back to the previous map. There it is. So I want, to take, want you to take a look, and I'm going to zoom in right here and look at how large the land claims were that France and England made. Now, keep in mind that settlers from France had arrived in the early 1500s, and as these settlements grew, English settlers moved west in, and west and further and further west, so we can look in this one, so you can see that the colonies are gradually moving, and they kind of stop at the Appalachian Mountains, but as the set settlements grow, grew, the English settlers kind of pushed farther and farther inland, uh, which was good because it was taking over the land, but it could potentially disrupt the French trade from Canada down through the Mississippi River. So these English settlers were kind of pushing into areas that the French had already claimed. So. We have the English settlers moving into the Ohio Valley, um, which at that point had already been claimed by the French, but who had been there first? That's right, Native Americans lived there for hundreds of years before either the English or the French showed up. But with the growing conflict, a lot of the tribes knew that they would either have to take sides in this white man's war or potentially be wiped out in the process. So a lot of the tribes were starting to say, like, look, we need, we need to do something. We need to take a side. And the sides that they chose really showed the difference, different ways that the French and the English had of relating to the Native Americans. And these differences were due in part because of the social and economic reasons that they had for being there. Most of the French that had settled were hunters and trappers, so they tended to cooperate with the Indians because they would trade with them. Um, some would marry the Nat marry their Native American women, um, so they would cooperate more because they would help them with uh, hunting and trapping. And we're looking right here at a picture of uh, the Huron, and the Huron were one of the groups that the French had really built strong relationships with, and. So in turn, the French kind of expected that they would fight on their side. So on one side you have the French, on the other side you have the English. And as we, as, as we all know, as we learned in chapter 4, many of the English settl settlers had left England for religious reasons. Some had come for economic opportunity, but a large chunk of the English settlers had come for religious re reasons and wanted to take the opportunities given to them in America to try and convert the Native Americans to Christianity. And there were stories of cruelty uh, between the English and the Indians on both sides, but a good working relationship was able to be developed between the English and especially with the mighty Iroquois nation, and the Iroquois were the largest and most powerful group of Indians living in America at that time. And they're, as we see from this map, they were located in what's now New York State, primarily. So if you've ever uh, gone up into New York State, you'll recognize some of these names, uh, Seneca, Cayuga, One Oneida, Mohawk. So those may sound familiar as areas in uh, in North, or excuse me, in New York. Well, they're named after uh, the nations of the Iroquois nation. And just like the English and the French were enemies, the Iroquois and the Huron were also enemies. So it almost seemed natural that the Iroquois would join the English to fight their rivals. To understand how young George Washington could set such momentous events into motion, we have to go back in time, before he blundered into battle. 
and see how the stage had already been set for war. Spring, 1752, two years before George Washington's battle in the woods. Speculators from Washington's native Virginia are coming to Pennsylvania to negotiate with the region's Indians for land. They're after a foothold in one of the most contested regions of North America. In the 1750s, Britain holds the East Coast while Canada and the Mississippi Valley are dominated by the French. Between those two empires lies a giant prize called the Ohio Country, a region the size of France that is largely empty and up for grabs. Both France and Britain set their sights on one spot in particular, a strategic river junction called the Forks of the Ohio, where Pittsburgh stands today. But the forts of the Ohio isn't theirs for the taking. The native people consider this their land and not something that can be traded or sold. But there is one Indian leader in the region who is willing to talk, the half king, the same man who will play such an important role in George Washington's life two years later. Don't ever forget that any sign of friendship that we make to the English will not escape the French. French seem weak. While the English traders give us goods and our hunters bring the skins. In native tradition, women elders provide counsel for important decisions. For the half king, the stakes in this upcoming negotiation couldn't be higher. Most of the region's Indians prefer the French. But if the British offer him generous trade goods to distribute among these people, an alliance with Britain could put him in a position of power. It's a dangerous gamble, but the half king has few options. These people are refugees who have been driven out of their homelands in the East by tribal wars and European settlers. Diseases have devastated their numbers. Now 3,000 of them have made the Ohio country their new homeland. They guard it jealously. But with the French encroaching from the north and the English from the east, the half king knows he must make some kind of accommodation. <laughs> Why are they firing? Nothing to fear. It's their way of welcome. It's when they fire their guns at the end of the power that you need to worry. Parleys between Indians and whites are a fact of frontier life. And the rules are well established. Trade goods grease the wheels. The Virginians have brought a small fortune. The items are more than just gifts. Native people rely on European goods for their survival. Providing a steady supply of these necessities will go far toward securing Indian allies. 
And then there is wampum, crucial to any parley. Intricately woven belts and strings, encoded with messages of war, peace, and friendship. Until there is a ceremonial passing of the wampum, no negotiation would be complete. When it came to winning favor with the Ohio Valley Indians, the British had some catching up to do. Years of land swindles had left native peoples suspicious of British motives. The French, on the other hand, had traded with the Indian nations and fought beside Indian warriors for more than a century. So for the visiting Virginians, this uh, parley was more than just closing a land deal. It was about winning these people over. The Half King is playing a delicate diplomatic game between the British and the French. And to make it more complicated, he's not altogether his own master in this negotiation. The Half King and his people are one of many Indian groups and they are far from the most powerful. The dominant force in the Northeast is the Iroquois League, a coalition of six nations spread across northern New York. The Iroquois claim sovereignty over the Ohio country and all the Indians who live there. Technically, they haven't authorized the Half King to make an agreement with the British. So if he goes ahead and does it anyway, he'll be asserting his independence from the Iroquois League. In fact, he's called the Half King because of his limited authority. But if he can strike a good deal with the British at this parley, it could make him a leader to be reckoned with. Brethren, be assured that the King, our father, in purchasing your lands, had never any... In Why is it taking so long? He is not the way it is with the Indians, there will be much talk and even more giving of gifts before the meat of the matter is addressed. Kindly accept this belt as a symbol of our two peoples living together as one. The talking goes on for more than a week. Finally, the Half King agrees to let the Virginians build a small trading post at the Forks. With the two European empires encroaching on the Ohio country, the Half King has chosen what seems the best of two bad options. The French claim all the land on one side of the river. And English claim everything on the other. If that be the case, I ask, where does the Indian land lie? We live in a country between, and therefore the land belongs to neither one nor to the other. But the great being above allowed it to be a place of residence for us. Philip, how do we say farewell? Ni wapete halepshilepwa. Ni wapete halepshilepwa. So the Virginians leave the parley, having secured the half king's support. He will back the English over the French, and he will allow the Virginians to return the following year to build their post at the forks of the Ohio River. The full effects of the Half King's decision won't be felt for years to come. And one thing is certain, the French are not about to give up the forks without a fight. 
One look at the map shows why. The French already control Canada and the Great Lakes region. By building a string of outposts through the Ohio country, they could link their French forts in Canada with their Louisiana colony and keep the British bottled up on the East Coast. A memorandum by the Marquis de la Galicionnaire, governor of New France, urges action. If the rapid progress of the English colonies be not arrested, they will possess, in a short time, formidable armaments on the continent of America. And if that happens, warns the Marquis, then all the other French colonies will fall to the British as well. Which brings us to the beginning of the French and Indian War. Now, a little bit of, a little bit of history for this. From 1689 until 1784, there were three different wars fought between Great Britain and France. Now, we kind of we, we use the term Great Britain and England kind of uh, interchangeably for this time period because in 1707, England and Scotland had combined to form the United Kingdom of Great Britain. So when I use Great Britain or England, that's, I mean, the United Kingdom of Great Britain. So when we're dealing with this time period, keep that in mind. And so there have been these three large war, large conflicts from 1689 to 1784. And each time those wars ended peacefully, but that peace wasn't very stable because a few years later, fighting would resume. So this time, the first shots of what would become known as the French and Indian War here in North America, or in Europe it's known as the Seven Years' War, the first shots would be fired in a little fourth just south of present-day Uniontown, Pennsylvania, my home. And leading the British forces was this familiar face, a 22-year-old major from Virginia named George Washington. So how did it all start? Well, Washington had been sent from Virginia to inform the French to leave the Ohio Valley. So this was his destination, uh, the French Fort Duquesne. But, so the English send him out to Fort Duquesne to tell the French, all right, you guys need to leave the Ohio Valley because we're moving in. And the French ignored this. So after returning to Virginia with the French refusal message, he was ordered to return and build a fort where the Allegheny and the Monongahela rivers met to form the Ohio. And if you go to that site right now, you can see the home of the Pittsburgh Steelers. But, but back to history. So Washington shows up and lo and behold, there's already a French there, a French fort there, Fort Duquesne, built on that very site. Now, while he was on his way, Washington had attacked a group of French scouts, and as we saw in the previous video, one of the wounded officers was killed by one of Washington's Indian allies. So he fell back to a nearby meadow, and his men hurriedly constructed a fort they nicknamed Fort Necessity. And there she is in all of her glory, Fort Necessity. That's actually as it looks to this day. Now, as you can see, the fort was very hastily built. Uh, and he put it right in the middle of a field. It was not easily easy to defend. So Washington's forces were pretty easily defeated at Fort, Necess Fort Necessity, and that's primarily because Washington was trying to fight in the European style of marching out and forming lines and then firing while the French and the Indians shot from behind trees and rocks. They used, they used the natural surroundings for cover. And because of this, because of these antiquated tactics, Washington was forced to surrender, but the French allowed him to return to Virginia. So imagine what would have happened if they had been killed, he had been killed or captured that day. Would the country exist as we know it today? I don't know. It's a great question to ask. So there were no, not just 
military defeats, but there were also legislative defeats, as we will see here. Now, this is a this is a, an image of a flag, and it's kind of gruesome, isn't it? Uh, what do you think the point of this picture was? Well, while Washington was at Fort Necessity, delegates from seven of the 13 states met in Albany, New York, to try and really nail down a treaty with the Iroquois Nation, as well as figure out how they were going to defend the colonies. Now, you got to keep in mind, at this time, each colony acted like it was its own little tiny country. So that would be like trying to not unify 13 states, but unify 13 separate countries. And at the meeting, was, representing Pennsylvania was none other than Benjamin Franklin, and he proposed what's called the Albany Plan of Union. Why is it called that? Because they met in Albany and it was a plan to unify the colonies. I love simple naming. And the Albany Plan of Union would create a central government for the colonies that could make laws, raise taxes, and set up defense for the colonies. Now, th this would not be in opposition to Briti British rule, but it would act more like a local government for the colonies. So each of the colonies was, st was still going to be under the British crown, under British parliament, but the Albany Plan of Union would unify the colonies in North America and kind of act as a, like I said, as a local government. So coming together like that, that sounds, that's, sounds like a good idea, right? I agree. All of the delegates voted to accept the plan, but when it was submitted to the colonial legislatures, it was rejected. Not a single colony approved the plan, which really frustrated a lot of people, especially Ben Franklin. And the, the picture that we saw earlier, here, I'm going to bring it back. This one of the chopped up snake, well, that appeared in Franklin's Pennsylvania Gazette in 1754. So he printed it in his in his paper but then it was distributed throughout the colonies and if you want to take a look notice that each piece of the snake represents one colony with the head kind of representing all of New England and what he was trying to say with that is that each piece is important to the whole and without all of the pieces the snake is going to die so without all of the pieces coming together the nation would die so that was all going on while, while Washington was at Fort Necessity. So back to the military defeat side of it. Now, after Washington failed to take Fort Duquesne, General Edward Braddock promised to easily run the French out of the fort. Braddock was a very well-respected but also very stubborn general uh, and who had won many battles in Europe, but really did not have a lot of experience fighting in the forests of North America. So he pushed through noisily with his men through the forest, and even though Indian scouts and Washington himself warned him that the French were close by. So as Braddock closed in on Fort Duquesne, the French launched, launched a surprise attack, which resulted in the deaths of Braddock and of half of his men. And once again, Washington was involved with this and barely escaped with his life. So, once again, Washington was able to survive after losing a battle with the French. And much like the Battle of Fort Necess at Fort Necessity, the French used their surroundings for cover and were able to very easily overpower the British. And this war would continue on for, for many years after that, but basically, this is kind of how it went for the next two years of the war. Um, it was very, very similar to this. The British would attack French forts, and they were pretty much unsuccessful. And even though the English outnumbered the French two to one, the French were more experienced and better equipped to fight in the force of North America, which was a huge advantage for them. And with every defeat, that alliance that the English had with their Indian allies, specifically the Iroquois, well, with each defeat, that alliance became more and more strained because the tribes that had sided with the English, uh, they sided with them so that they would protect them from the French. But if the English lost, what was going to happen to them? 
Well, since this lesson is coming to you in American English and not in Fr not in French, I I don't know French. Obviously, something had to happen to turn the tide of the war towards the Fr towards the English. Now, from those first shots in 1754 until 1757, so uh, close to three years, the British had been on the losing side of the war. But something changed in 1757 when this man, Mr. William Pitt, became the new head of the British government. At that time, we've got to, got to keep in mind, the British were not only fighting in North America, but they were also fighting in other parts of the world. So what Pitt did when he became the head of the, head of the government was decided to take all those fighting forces and focus first on winning the war in North America before moving on to those other conflicts. So Pitt sent Great Britain's best generals, collected them from, from Europe, and sent them to North America and promised very large land grants and large payments to colonists who would support the war. Now, so under Pitt's leadership, the British started making some headway, in, especially in 1758, by first capturing Louisbourg, which was the most important French fort, French fort in Canada. And they also captured Fort Duquesne, which we're looking at right now, and as you can see, was renamed Fort Pitt and is now home to the Steelers, the Penguins, the Pirates, uh, and home to one of my absolute favorite places on Earth, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. So the, starting in 1758, we see the, the British start to win some key battles, and they continued to win through 1759 and pushed the French out of present-day New York State uh, and made them fall back into Canada. But the key to winning the war would really be to capture the capital of New France, which was the city of Quebec. Without Quebec, the French would not be able to move supplies from the north down to their soldiers in the south. But taking the city was not going to be... Now, Quebec was located on the Plains of Abraham, which is a very high cliff bordered on two sides by the St. Lawrence River. And so it's, it's very, very, uh, very tough to, to attack. And the only logical way to attack the city would be to land your forces downriver and then march directly at the city. Um, as we can see from the map, uh, the city was bordered on two sides by the river, so the French general, Marquis de Montcalm, placed most of his forces in front of the city, represented by the blue lines right here. So in order to win the battle, the British general, James Wolfe, was going to need to employ some unconventional tactics. Now remember how I said the only logical way would be to land downriver and then attack Quebec head-on? Well, that was the only logical way. It was illogical that anyone would try to attack from the river because, as we can see from this painting, there were very steep cliffs. So, and so I said Montcalm had the majority of his forces in front of the city, so he really only left a few soldiers to guard those sides. So what the British General Wolfe did was ordered some of his troops to quietly row late at night upriver and climb the cliffs. So the next morning, Montcalm awoke to a force of 4,000 British troops waiting for him. And the battle was very fierce, uh, but by the, time, by the time it was over, thousands lay dead on both sides, including Montcalm and Wolfe. But the British had won. Five days later, the city of Quebec surrendered to the British, thus ending the war in North America. So... To sum it all up, the Battle of Quebec ended the French and Indian War in North America, and those last three words are very important. Why, you may ask? Well, the fighting in North America was finally over, but remember how I said that, uh, that William Pitt took all of his forces to focus on North America because they had been fighting in other places? Well, once the fighting in North America was over, they were able to move back into those other locations that they were fighting and back in Europe. And fighting continued until 1763 when Britain and France signed the Treaty of Paris, which 
officially brought this long war to an end. Now, while the fall of Quebec brought an end to the fighting in North America, the Treaty of Paris brought an end really to French power in North America almost completely. Britain gained Canada and all of the French lands east of the Mississippi River. France was able to keep two islands in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the islands in the West Indies, but as we can see in this North America after 1763, North America basically belongs to Spain and Great Britain. Now, Spain had entered the war in 1762 on the French side, so it ended up giving, giving up the area that is now Florida, but received all of the French land west of the Mississippi, along with the city of New Orleans, which we'll talk about in the future. So peace had finally come to North America, but in just a few short years, Britain would once again be at war in the colonies, but this time the war would be with the colonies. The French and Indian Wars resulted in the collapse of New France. The Treaty of Paris brought a resolution to the conflicts. England gained all of North America east of the Mississippi River, including Canada and Florida. The French relinquished Louisiana west of the Mississippi to Spain. The Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Years' War in 1763, was in many ways a huge victory for the British. Following the treaty, the British were essentially the dominant European power over all of North America east of the Mississippi River. They gained New France from the French, giving them control over the eastern portion of Canada. Their control ran all the way north through Nova Scotia, the very northern Canadian provinces. The British also did very well in the Caribbean, getting control of some of the minor French sugar islands like Dominica, St. Vincent, Granada. England gained many new colonies coming out of the French and Indian Wars. We tend to think of the colonies as numbering 13, but England possessed far more than this. We remember and celebrate those colonies which revolted and joined together to form the United States on July 4, 1776. And we tend to forget those colonies such as Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, which did not join the United States. Interestingly, the losers were awarded some territory that had long-range value. In giving up New France, the French actually only gave up a colony which was always a money loser, and never a money winner. Most importantly, the French were able to keep some of their larger sugar islands, such as Martinique and particularly Saint-Domingue, uh, which brought far more, produced far more revenue for France than Canada ever did. England had made a major commitment in protecting her colonies and her subjects in America from the exploits of the French and Spanish. England's costly struggle to defend her investments in North America depleted the British Treasury. And they prevailed because they invested unprecedented numbers of soldiers and warships and munitions and spent a lavish amount of money and doubled their national debt doing so. At the end of the war, they had to pay off that debt. They had to at least service the debt. And they needed to pay the costs of maintaining the garrisons in the Indian country around the Great Lakes. This led the British government to seek higher taxes from the American colonists. Taxation without representation would become a cry that helped set the stage for the American Revolution a short 13 years away. But the colonial perspective was that any tax was bad news, that it would erode their prosperity, that it would set a negative precedent, that the British would keep asking for more and more taxes. They also felt that they had a primary right as English people not to be taxed unless they were represented in the sovereign institution, which was Parliament. The French, while their North American colonization ended in 1763, made an imprint on the American way of life. 
New Orleans and its French heritage is a good example. Many French words have become part of our vocabulary, like hors d'oeuvre, rendezvous, and boulevard. Other names the French gave to American places include Detroit, Michigan, Racine, Wisconsin, Terre Haute, Indiana, Des Moines, Iowa, and St. Louis, Missouri. In other programs in this series, we'll explore the early settlements of the English, the Spanish, and the Dutch, and discover more about the birth and the earliest formative years of our nation. Which brings us to our assignment for today. Now, there is not a written assignment for today's lesson because it was really such like a long, long lesson, but what I want you to do is to go back and review the key terms and the main ideas for tomorrow's quiz. There will be a quiz on chapter 5, section 1 tomorrow, so I'm giving you tonight to relearn and study all of this uh, awesome stuff because it's, it's really, a, really is a lot here. So the things I want you to focus on are the key terms um, and the key battles. Well, I only mentioned a few, so there's a good chance that a few of those battles will show up in the quiz. And you need to know what happened in each of those battles. For instance, the fighting began at Fort Necessity. Uh, the Treaty of Paris officially ended the war. The, uh, the Battle of Quebec ended the war in North America. So take your time. Uh, and take your time on the quiz, and if you have any questions, please let me know before you hit submit and turn the quiz turn the quiz in. All right? So key terms, key battles, and key everything else. All right? And if there, if you like I said, if you have any questions, please come and find me, and I'll do my best to help you out. If not, have a great rest of your day.